Welcome, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I am Dean Risa Golubov. I am privileged to work in the house that Dick Merrill built and to follow in his footsteps. I want to thank you all for coming today to honor and remember Dick, who was a giant of the law, the legal academy, and this law school, and also a mentor and friend to so many. You have been listening to the Early Grove Street Trio, whom we thank very much for being here. At the request of the family, they will now play the Ashokan Farewell. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the celebration of the life of Richard Austin Merrill with us today are Lissa, of course, and their children, Patricia, Patty, and John, John's wife, Maria, and their children, Julia Grace, and Esme Elizabeth, and Luke Douglas, and also Dick's brother, Stephen Merrill, and his partner, Doug Gold, and other relatives as well. Uh, Lissa, we're grateful to you and your family for sharing this occasion with the law school uh, you will remember, I think, that now nearly 20 years ago, we had a comparable event for Emerson Spees. And like Dick, Emerson was spoken about by a couple of friends and by children. And Dick conducted that event. And I well remember the elegance and the economy and the poise with which he did so. I hope we can do today half as well for Dick as he did for us. In my experience, law teachers like to think that they have some lasting impact on their students. This is generally not true. <laughs> I, I've had graduates who cheerfully reminded me of taking a course that I never taught, <laughs> and those are the ones who remember you at all. But occasionally, there are relations between teacher and student that develop into something important and durable ripen into an important relationship. And that was true for Liz McGill and Dick Merrill. Liz studied under Dick when she was in law school and then became a colleague of his on the faculty. 
Now, partly, I think that relationship was substantive. Liz, like Dick, became an expert in administrative law concerned with the relations among the various entities and agencies of government. Partly, the relationship was based on what I would describe as a kind of intellectual affinity. Liz, like Dick, is a person of balance, of moderate judgment, um, more interested in understanding than in display, more concerned with being right than with being clever. Only those of you who work in the academy who recognize those traits as being unusual. <laughs> in part, however, Liz's relationship with Dick sprang from and grew into a deeply personal affection, so much so that when Dick passed away, Dick Mer uh, Ken Abraham told me that he felt like he should send condolences to Liz, as well as to the members of the Merrill family. Let me add only this. We here at the law school had hoped and planned for Liz to succeed Dick as dean following Paul Mahoney. Uh, now, we've landed on our feet. I don't mean to suggest that. But, <laughs> but the decision was taken out of our hands. We were beaten to the punch by Stanford which in 2012 made Liz the dean and the Richard E. Lang professor. And her appointment to that distinguished post is Stanford's gain and our loss. We're glad to have you back, Liz, if only for today. Before he spoke, John described that as a minimalist introduction. I, I beg to differ. So like everyone here, I would rather not be gathering to remember Dick Merrill. I would be for, prefer to be talking to him, to enjoying his company. Lissa, Patty, John, Maria, Stephen, I'm so sorry for your loss. I'm honored that you asked me to speak about Dick today, and I hope the words I have to offer you resonate with you and help his memory be a blessing. I met Dick in the fall of 1992 when I was a first-year law student here. I visited his office hours to see if he thought I might be able to enroll in his spring 93 course on Native American law, which, as a Westerner with some exposure to the Native American tribes in my home state of North Dakota, I was very eager to do. I asked him if he thought a first-year could take this difficult class, and he answered, absolutely. I then asked if he thought the class would have space for a 1L student like me, who, after all, had a third shot at getting into elective like this, after the 3L students and the 2L students. Will it fill up, he leaned back. No, he said with a smile. <laughs> Not in a thousand years. I had been in awe of his CV, which I had studied before I went to his office, and a bit intimidated by his sartorial style. A bow tie, as I remember it, suspenders, and what looked to me to be extremely fancy English shoes. I think I was on my guard, ready to be judged by this highly accomplished person and former dean of the law school. But his manner was not at all what I expected. He was completely comfortable in his own skin, he was self-possessed without a trace of arrogance. He had a notable but very understated warmth. He was interested in me, and had a dry sense of humor, a humor so dry and unexpected that I almost missed it. He was, as I knew from the resume, a very big deal, but he made me feel right at home as I sat there in his office talking to him. In case you're wondering, Native American law is a ridiculously hard course that should never be taken by a first-year law student. <laughs> but in thinking about Dick and what I wanted to say about him today, what stood out to me from my first exposure to him in that class was his character, his generosity, his humility, his humanity. One thing was how he dealt with all of us, the students. In what was a standard pattern in all of his classes, I took three from him, he remembered, he asked us on the first day of class to fill out a note card about why we were taking the class. He remembered what we said, and he made a point to ask people to contribute when their experience was relevant to what we were talking about. As a result of that, Dick made sure that later in the term, when a member of the Navajo tribe was in the class and had direct experience with the Indian Gaming Act of 1988, he made sure that that student spoke up and contributed what he knew, which was a lot more than most of us. 
Being a law student, especially a 1L law student, is often compared to being in high school. I think middle school might be a better uh, <laughs> analogy, but that was not true in Dick's classroom. We were adults, we were potential partners in this class, and we, will certainly, we were certainly future colleagues of his, whether we were interested in the academy or in law practice. In another sign of his character, that term, Dick co-taught many of the classes with Lindsay Robertson, a UVA JD who had returned to UVA to get a PhD in history. Lindsay took the lectern to teach the most famous case in that class, and perhaps better described as the most infamous case, a case called Johnson versus McIntosh, John Marshall's 19, 1890, 1823 landmark decision. That case is a staple of first-year property classes, too, because it's there that the Supreme Court determined that European sovereigns who had, quote, discovered North America had rights to the land, turning the native people who had lived on that land for generations into tenants of the Europeans. On that day, Dick completely turned over the podium to Lindsay. It's a little like turning over the podium on Marbury versus Madison if you're teaching constitutional law. And Dick did more than that. He conveyed to all of us his excitement that Lindsay was with us, and he signaled that we were in the presence of a true expert on the subject. All of us, including Dick, were students of Lindsay's that day. I count taking that class and getting to know Dick as one of the greatest blessings of my life. After taking Native American law, I became a Dick Merrill recidivist. I was his RA that summer. I took administrative law and food and drug law from him. When I had the privilege of joining this faculty in 1997, I co-taught food and drug law with him three times, had countless conversations over lunches and dinners with him, and if we were lucky, with Lissa, and joined the administrative law casebook that he and Jerry Mashaw had originally constructed in the early 1970s. Knowing Dick was a blessing for me in a very practical way, for his confidence in me made certain that I had an embarrassment of professional opportunities that were sent my way. But it was a blessing in a deeper way as well. By example, Dick taught me enduring lessons about what it is to be a scholar, a teacher, a leader, and most important, a decent human being. Let me reflect on each of them for just a moment. Legal scholars, as John suggested, come in all stripes. Some have a strong perspective. They find useful in understanding the world, and that shapes everything they see. Some rage broadly across many different fields of knowledge and knit together things that would not have otherwise seemed connected, but once in the scholar's hands do seem connected. Others discover things we just did not yet know and are important enough to shape our understanding. Dick's signature was something quite different. Above all, I think he did work that was useful to those who were doing work in the world that interested him. Judges, policymakers, government decision makers, and other scholars working at the intersection of science and law and in health and safety regulation. He chose topics that were incredibly complex. He was a master of quantitative risk assessment, of food safety regulation, of the regulatory treatment of carcinogens. He took on topics that were rich with overlapping and confused regulatory authority and scattered and sometimes incoherent histories. What his work provided was clarity where before him there was confusion. And it was clarity to all of the many and varied people working in the relevant fields. His mastery of the relevant regulatory science, as well as the statutes, the regulations, and the regulatory approach meant that the readers of the Virginia Law Review, or Health Affairs, or my favorite, Regulatory and Toxicology and Pharmacology Review, <laughs> all looked for something written by Merrill if they wanted to understand a complex topic at the intersection of science and law. I've already spoken a little bit about Dick as a teacher and the respect he showed for us as his students, but the hallmark of his scholarship showed as well in his teaching. I think his first goal was for us to understand, and the more complex the topic, the more he shined. In Native American law, he gave a lecture on water rights and the Western prior appropriation doctrine and how those doctrines intersected with water rights claims brought by Native American tribes. It's a lecture I still remember. And he was way ahead of his time. This was 1993. There was no PowerPoint. Dick spent 20 minutes before the class creating images and graphs and charts on the board in order to highlight and have us visualize the points he was making about the stakes in that debate. In Food and Drug Law, his lecture on quantitative risk assessment, how agencies decided whether something was safe, is one I still remember. 
In that lecture, he assimilated and distilled many different bodies of knowledge into a coherent picture of how an agency made a very difficult decision. He explained the experiments and the scientific theories that formed the basis for the scientific approach, laid bare the key assumptions of the approach, and incorporated the many and varied statutory and regulatory schemes that were applied to the same question across different agencies. Dick Merrill as a leader is something I I didn't get to experience as much as many in this room because I came to the law school four years after he had stepped down as dean. I did go to him with various problems I encountered as vice dean, and I saw so many of the virtues that my colleagues spoke of. He was canny, he was wise, he was calm, and he was slyly funny. But perhaps what stood out most to me is that he was disinterested in the very best way. People often speak of the importance of selflessness in leadership, that is, not mistaking yourself for the institution. And I have no doubt that Dick was a selfless leader. But if selflessness applies no ego, I think that's got it completely wrong. Dick's ego was healthy. No query posed any sort of threat to him, to who he was, or what he had done. He was, as I noticed when I very first met him, comfortable in his skin. What's left for me to say is only the most important part, and that's the hardest part. Dick Merrill as a decent human being. From the first moment I met him to our very last conversation, Dick was a whole human being. You could not walk into his office without knowing that he was from somewhere in the Southwest, and he was interested in the art and history of that region. You could not walk into his office and not know about Lissa. Lissa first, and Patty, and John. That wonderful, wonderful close-up picture of Lissa's face was right on Dick's desk for him and everyone else to see. Entering the house that he and Lissa built together was also entering the world of a couple who had many passions and interests. In their family, and where they were from, in travel, in architecture, in sports, in gardens, and of course, in dogs. I remember so many stories of trips with the family, with the grandchildren, family reunions, talks about books, about what I was reading, what he was reading, history or fiction, stories of tennis games long past, and I remember painful and candid conversations about his illness and moving once and then moving again. I want to end on a hopeful note. I admit it's hard. This was a person I admired for all he did in the world and for the life that he lived. But this is also a man I loved for his realness and the fact that he was so human. I remember saying to him that moving to Westminster was a very good idea. And he said, yes, that's what Lisa says, but I hate it. (laughs) So what is hopeful to say about this man who left us too soon and too painfully? His was a life very well lived, and we will miss him because of the love we had for him. That's the best I can do today. It is a fact, applauded by some and regretted by others, that law schools have, in recent years, moved closer to the university and become more distant from the profession. Uh, That's evident in the increasing number of my colleagues who have uh, real doctorates, doctorates in something other than law. I think law professors come in two varieties. Some of us are lawyers who happen to teach. Others are academics who happen to teach law. At Virginia, I think we currently have a pretty nice balance of those two perspectives, and that seems to me healthy and right. Who knows whether that balance will endure or whether... In retrospect, uh, we will uh, be seen as a way station along the road to an academy completely divorced from the profession. We in the retirement generation, as I like to think of myself, uh, cannot anticipate how our successors will think about that choice, but I think we know how Dick Merrill would have felt, for he was the epitome and ideal of the lawyer professor. Dick's practice was in the field uh, firm of Covington and Burling, and we had planned to have here a longtime colleague and friend from that firm, Peter Barton Hutt. Aside from his four years as chief counsel of the FDA, Peter Hutt was always at Covington and was associated with Dick and many projects over the years. But Peter 
taught a short course in Harvard this week and is unable to get out of Boston. So I have printed his remarks, some of which I will read to you. I realize that's a second best. Peter's picking up at the time when Dick joined the firm of Covington. At that time, Covington's H. Thomas Austin, a man whom I will say everyone in Washington called Tommy Austin, but not to his face, was the most respected food and drug lawyer in the country. He was notorious for requisitioning the brightest and best young associates who came to the firm, and he latched on to Dick Merrill, who worked with him for his entire four years there. According to Peter, when Dick left, he was already functioning on a partnership level. After Dick had been at Covington for a year, he began to share his office with a new associate named Michael Boudin, now a judge on the First Circuit. Two of them shared that office for three years. Peter called that the greatest concentration of sheer intellectual brilliance I've ever encountered. Shortly after Dick left Covington to come to Virginia, Peter Hutt became chief counsel. And he, I'm quoting him now, when I left the FDA in 1975, I persuaded Dick to take that position. He was initially reluctant, but I convinced him that he would never understand the real world administrative law if he turned down this opportunity. He contributed substantially to all areas of the FDA in the next two years. When it was time to leave, the new FDA commissioner, Donald Kennedy, strongly urged him to remain. Kennedy did not succeed, but the two remained close friends and collaborators. And Peter records that when Dick stepped down as dean, he was approached by the University of Utah to become the president of that institution, but after deliberation, withdrew. And now I'll quote a paragraph. This is following his decision not to become the president of Utah. Covington seized upon that opportunity, and Dick agreed to become of counsel in 1991. That extraordinarily productive relationship lasted for 17 years, he continued his food and drug law practice, but his favorite client was the Chemical Industry Institute of Technology, where he served as general counsel. Funded by both industry and government, CIIT conducted research and training programs on the effect of chemicals on human health, subject that Liz just mentioned, a subject that Dickens explored for his entire career. He was elected a member of the Institute of Medicine, but he left the FDA and he chaired many important committees. Peter would have closed by saying that he had been friends with Dick Merrill for 50 years, that lengthy friendships like that are rare. I will treasure the memory of our times together for the rest of my life. Patty Merrill is an alumna of the law school and also of the college, what locally is called a double who. She graduated from the law school in 1992, and her involvement with this institution echoes the commitments of her father. One of the law school's great accomplishments, I think its greatest institutional achievement, is to have made itself into an appropriate object for the philanthropy of its graduates. For public institutions, that is not easy. When I went to law school, people assumed that the state of Virginia supported the university and that they gave it the office when they paid taxes. The long-standing effort of private institutions to mobilize their alumni for support was for public institutions just barely beginning. Hardy Dillard was the first dean to see the need for this, and he drafted Graham Lilly on a part-time basis to begin what has now become the Law School Foundation. Monrad Paulson, the next dean, was not ideally adapted to this purpose. <laughs> Emerson Spees enjoyed the alumni and perhaps enjoyed them too much to really press. <laughs> Dick Merrill was the first dean to put the shoulder to the wheel in private fundraising. When he became dean, the total assets of the Law School Foundation were just under $8 million. When he left, they were over 27. That's a 350% increase over eight years, a record no future dean can hope to match. And participation figures tell the same story. The percentage of graduates giving to the law school rose every single year during Dick's time as dean. 
Today, the law school has over $500 million in assets, ahead of every other public law school, behind only Harvard, Yale, Stanford, and Columbia, and boost, boast participation rates that are the best of any law school in the country, whether public or private. That success has many fathers and mothers, too, but the foundation was laid by Dick Merrill. Now, the reason I mention all this in connection with Patty is that she became exactly the kind of active, engaged, and generous graduate that Dick foresaw and cultivated. Patty's been a member of the Law School Alumni Council, president of the Law School Alumni Association, and since her graduation, class manager for the class of 1992. Last year, that class had a participation percentage of 53%, which in my world is spectacular. Of course, Patty does have a career aside from helping the law school. She, <laughs> she lives in Richmond in Virginia and for the past 16 years has worked there for Genworth Financial, where she is now Senior Vice President and Deputy General Counsel. Patty? On behalf of the entire Merrill family, I want to thank you for being here, and especially Peter, who's kind of here, um, and Liz for their lovely tributes to Dad. I also want to acknowledge my mom. Today is about Dad, but you're the foundation around which he built his life. Much of what has been said and written has been about Dad has focused on the professional life and accomplishments of Dick Merrill. I want to provide a window into his life at home with us. From as far back as I can remember, our family room always had a chair in the corner where my dad sat. It was designated dad's chair, and anyone who sat there was a visitor and would gently be preempted by its rightful occupant. While the chair itself and the house surrounding it changed, the chair's placement was constant. It was surrounded by nooks, crannies, boxes, and every kind of Levenger filing device ever invented. Everything was perfectly organized. Pens, pencils, legal pads, binder clips, textbooks, class materials, articles on virtually every topic imaginable, the book he was reading, and a pile of books he intended to read, the newspaper, New Yorker magazines, and the New York Review of Books just to name about 20% of what was squirreled away. The chair always had a good view of the television, though it was rarely on, and was proximate to a stereo in a large music collection, which ranged from classical to bluegrass. If Dad was in the house and not asleep, more likely than not, he was in the chair. He gathered the day's news, prepared for class, edited his work, graded papers, plotted vacations, reviewed photographs, completed the taxes, read book after book, thumbed through catalogs. It's true, he liked a good catalog. <laughs> Watched all manner of sports, opened Christmas presents, greeted guests, all while sitting in the chair. Although he always appeared to be busy, he was always available for a question, an explanation, a suggestion, or advice. He was particularly ready to wield his red pen on John's and my papers to help us become better writers. All we ever needed to do was ask. The lessons from Dad in that chair are innumerable and emblematic of who he was. Conveyed through example or with a subtlety that left me unaware of how much or what exactly I was absorbing. I'll highlight just a few. There was barely a day during which we did not watch at least one news program. The morning news ran during breakfast, and our typical evening consisted of Dad settling into his chair pre-dinner to have a cocktail or glass of wine. He usually arrived in the middle of the local news, but in time for the sports reporting, which was followed by the national news, typically CBS with Walter Cronkite and later Dan Rather. We would then retire to the dinner table to discuss the news, including the news contained in the two to four newspapers that arrived at our house every day. Sunday morning would have us reading the paper and watching the Sunday news shows, only to cap the day off with the evening news and 60 minutes. 
Very little of consequence happened in, our, in the world that we did not know about or discuss. Perhaps the one thing my father controlled in our house was the television. This control did not derive from some grand view of whether children should be permitted to watch television, and if so, what or how much. Nor did it arise from a desire for control. Dad lacked that impulse about anything. Rather, it resulted from the proximity of his chair to the television and whether having the television on was going to interrupt his activity. Having sports turned down in the background was not a distraction, and I quickly learned that I could watch television with him if I didn't mind watching sports. My dad liked the company, and it was one of the few times when he would share his knowledge about something without request. Watching sports was also one of the few times I ever remember my dad yelling or grumbling about anything. Seeing one of his favorite teams defeated had the momentary power to knock dad off his otherwise completely even keel. So what was my dad doing in the chair that might have been interrupted by the television? Most often he was preparing for something, a class, a new article or textbook revision, a presentation or speech. As a kid, I can remember being dumbfounded when my father would say, I need to prepare for class. My response, if you are the teacher, doesn't that mean you already know the material? And if you've taught the same classes for years, can't you just get out your notes from last year? He never responded to those questions directly. He just displayed diligence and commitment to his task. He knew that careful planning was essential to any successful interaction with a group of people you need to convince, sway, or teach. He also knew that his performance would be enhanced by practice and preparation. He was always seeking to improve his game, to teach the next class better than he had the last, to write a more interesting article, or just to bring his best self to whatever the next day presented. As a teenager, I was annoyed that our family room felt off limits to me and my friends because my dad was always in it. Without saying a word, Dad's presence provided an instant deterrent to mischief or misbehavior. But his presence also meant that he knew my friends. We inevitably passed through the family room where we would have brief or wide-ranging conversations with my parents. Whether from the neighborhood, college, or law school, he was always asking about what one friend or another was doing decades after meeting them. So as I later appreciated, Being present also lent to the human connections and relationships that he valued. Most of our family vacations originated from and were relived in the chair. Mom was responsible for logistics, but Dad played an active role in choosing the destination and what we would see along the way. Among the piles near the chair were maps and guidebooks, which would be examined and dissected in advance of any journey dog-eared before we even left the house. Upon return, he would review and cull the hundreds of slide photographs he would have taken on our trips. Finally, we would retrace our steps via a family viewing of our adventures on the slide projector. All of this with my dad directing from the chair. Vacation was not an opportunity for rest and relaxation or the constant return to a single locale. To the contrary, he enjoyed the excitement of traveling to new places, learning new histories, and experiencing new cultures. Returning home was the source of comfort, routine, and relaxation. I could go on and on. Dad in that chair was our engine, our rudder, our ballast, our anchor, and our beacon. He was central, but he was not in the center. He wanted to be part of our lives, but also demonstrated how we could provide the same stability to others. I can only hope that John and I have and will continue to conduct our lives as Dad would have wanted. Alert to world events, including who is winning and losing on the playing field, continually exploring new places, diligent and thoughtful about our professional pursuits, committed to our family, and most importantly, supportive of the people. Thank you. Uh, 
my most vivid memory of Dick Merrill is his way with words. As I bet Liz has discovered as dean, one of the principal responsibilities of the dean is to say something briefly when someone else is the important speaker. And that's harder than it sounds. Of course, any academic is prepared to talk for 50 minutes. That's, that's not difficult. But to say something apt and graceful and to have a substantive point and perhaps even a touch of wit in three or four minutes, now that is precious and rare. And Dick Merrill could do that better than anyone I have ever known. Time and again, in a variety of venues, he found words that exactly fit the occasion, that drew attention to the most constructive and useful aspect of whatever was about to happen, and that launched an event with just exactly the right note. And he made it seem effortless. Now, having tried to emulate him for many years, I think it couldn't have been effortless. Those little gems of short speeches, they had to have been planned and crafted and polished into that jewel-like perfection. But to watch him, you would think it was all ad lib and all the more charming for that. Now, you may think that these last remarks have created a high standard for our final speaker. <laughs> but I don't think you need to worry too much about him. John Merrill is an alumnus of Hamilton College and of Teach for America. He has an MBA from Yale and employment experience in a number of top-tier financial institutions. For 10 years plus, he was the managing director at TIF, the Investment Fund for Foundations which is a not-for-profit money manager for foundations, endowments, charities. In 2016, John joined the very much for-profit McKenna Capital, where he is managing director focused on endowment and foundation clients. John? It is indeed a tough group to follow, particularly Patty, of course. So thank you all so much for coming and joining the celebration of my dad's life. The love and support that you've extended to mom, Patty, and me, and I hope to one another, has helped a great deal and is deeply appreciated. Indeed, you all have been just like dad, kind and a constant source of support. As I reflect on how to carry forth his legacy, the best approach I can think of is simply to recommit myself to those qualities he embodied. Stay humble, respectful, dedicated, measured, curious, and attentive. It is obviously with some trepidation that I stand here today following such eloquent speakers in the building where dad once taught, mentored, and collaborated. At this institution, in these halls and classrooms, he did what we all strive to do. He made the most of life. He lived a life of learning, a life of impact, and of accomplishment. Others have captured his professional legacy, so I'll cover other terrain, hopefully adding to Patty's reflections. What I want to remember with you is the gentle, warm, fun, encouraging, and loving person that Dad was. Of course, I say remember with you because he was that way with all of us, however you knew him and whoever you were. Student, colleague, friend, niece, nephew, grandchild, in-law, daughter, wife, and I'm very lucky to say son. Dad was of western stock, from northern Utah. His hometown, Logan, is also the home of Utah State University. It's the northernmost reaches of the Wasatch Range and sits on the eastern shelf of Cache Valley, a picturesque expanse that stretches into Idaho, where his mother grew up. There were, and still are, a lot of Merrills in Cache Valley because Dad's great-grandfather, Mariner, was a Mormon settler with his eight wives and 43, some say 46, but 43 children. For those ca keeping tabs, Dad restrained himself to one wife and, <laughs> and two children, at least that I know of. At a recent reunion, our cousin Bobby Mangus took on the role of Mariner Merrill in a homespun family history musical produced and performed by the great nieces and nephews and grandchildren. 
you can hear the giggling because some of the uh, main actors were in the. Dad absolutely loved it. His father, Milt, was a beloved academic and administrator at Utah State University. Sound familiar? His mother, Bessie Austin, was an educator, active in her community, and a force of personality. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Together with his brother, Steve, the family lived in a small gray house on the edge of Utah State's campus, perched overlooking Logan and the Mormon temple, where his parents married only to soon thereafter renounce their very faith that dominated that community. Like his parents, Dad didn't have much time for the church, any church, in fact. But he always had a nostalgic connection to the West, Utah, and Utah State. In fact, one of the few accomplishments Dad was quick to showcase was his appointment at the age of 10 as ball boy of the Utah State Aggie football team. <laughs> Somewhere along the way, Dad developed a keen interest in Native American history and culture. My suspicion is that mom's equally curious and similar love for the West led them to this seam of discovery. It ultimately led dad, as you've heard, to some degree of professional involvement, teaching Indian law and counseling a few tribes on administrative matters. Many indigenous peoples introduced themselves by acknowledging their forebears in lineage and by name. There's a belief that you are who you are because of your family. Those who came before you and gave you your story, start. I can't help but think that Dad shared this belief. I know I do. The first time I went to a Dick Merrill celebration was when he retired from the FDA. It was the summer of 1978. I was fresh out of first grade and dressed to sweat <laughs> in a three-piece corduroy suit that Mom got on sale. <laughs> Dad assuredly was an Paul Stewart stoot, that he paid full price for. <laughs> a few things stand out in my memory from this event. First, there's the classic family photo that captures all of us in our 70s prime. Dad in his wide lapel, Paul Stewart, suit, bushy black hair, dangerously close to Afro status. Mom in a two-tone floral full-length maxi dress, as I've come to learn, <laughs> with an equally voluminous hairstyle. Patty in the requisite sundress and sunburn, if memory serves, uh, and I with a bowl cut and my three-piece corduroy suit. More substantively, I recall how people at the event were effusive, as we've heard today, in their admiration and affection for Dad. He had been at the FDA for just two years, and, that sh and in that short tenure, he made a meaningful impact on the institution and his colleagues. Lastly, I recall the extent to which mom was part of the celebration, nearly an equal recipient of the accolades. Mom had no formal role at the FDA, yet she was an important part of his success. She always was. Not because she inserted herself, but because dad's A-game was brought forth from his partnership with mom. Throughout his life, he relied on her counsel and friendship. She was his perfect complement. Last week over dinner, Maria and I recounted for Julia as man Luke how we met and how our relationship took off almost immediately. It occurred to me in the retelling of our story how similar it was to that of my parents. An introduction from a mutual fun friend. <laughs> that wasn't intended. I bet Dad stumbled into a joke along the way. Um, an introduction from a mutual friend one summer night, and then they off, they off they went on a blind date to a Dave Brubeck concert. There was an immediate connection. I'm sure it was rooted in some shared interests, but my sense is that it was really dominated by mutual admiration, a dynamic that persisted throughout their life together. Dad loved Mom's adventurous ways, boundless set of interests, willingness to take on a challenge, and general joie de vivre. He knew from the very minute they met that she would make him a better person. It certainly proved to be the case. He made strides because she was by his side as a true partner and friend. 
their mutual respect and admiration never wavered. With this duo at the helm, you can only imagine our family life. It was supportive, provocative, and fun, always filled with respect and warmth. Mom was the ringleader of fun with her spur-of-the-moment projects and adventures. Maybe at the reception I'll tell you about our cattle investing or panning for gold. (laughs) Dad, on the other hand, was the steadfast, ever-patient, measured voice that kept us focused and grounded. sounded like he did that here at the law school as well. They both always ensured we felt loved. Dad also modeled true dedication. Six days a week, he'd come here. And each night, as Patty mentioned, he'd spend two to three hours preparing for class or editing some casebook. Most days after work, Dad also would tackle a bit of yard work. He had his obsessions, raking leaves in the fall, cutting wood in the winter. Cousin Mark did that once with him. Um, And in weeding and watering all summer. He never shook his youth in the desert and had the belief that watering was the be-all and end-all of a healthy garden. And weeds were a lifelong nemesis. He couldn't resist uprooting an invasive enemy, regardless of where he was and what he was doing. More than once, I had to tell him, Dad, just hit the ball out of the trap and let's get moving. Stop. (laughs) He always had time for us, though. Among my fondest memories are hours of sports together. Each season found us playing a new game. Football in the fall, basketball and squash in the winter, baseball in the spring, golf and tennis in the summer. It'll come as no surprise that he was adept at everything. Though it wasn't always pretty. For you longtime Cavalier basketball fans, I'm sure there's some in the crowd, his jump shot looked just like that of Tom Sheehy's. No arc whatsoever, but very effective, particularly from the perimeter. Dad was a great coach, but an even better playmate. He and I were equally excited to get out in the yard or rush down to the boar's head to play whatever sport the season had in store for us. The only things that would stop us were darkness or the possibility of missing one of mom's meals. Of course, other vivid memories, as Patty's touched on, involved dad's help in my schoolwork. I want to do air quotes, Luke. Help in my (laughs) schoolwork. Uh, Mom was the in-house tutor for any sort of project, especially science project, where she was my ghost scientist. Dad was the resident writing tutor. Many of you probably have heard about the seminar that took place here a few years ago. It was billed as an exploration of how one man could make a difference in the field of administrative law. There were prominent lawyers, fellow academics, and government officials all discussing Dad's contributions to the field. It was all very interesting and quite impressive. But the real revelation came, especially for Patty and me, Uh, was the extent to which warm, supportive Dick Merrill had an eviscerating way of offering editorial suggestions to more than just his kids. It turned out that virtually everyone who collaborated with Dad had experienced his grievous red pen treatment. When we collectively realized that Dad attacked our writing with equal intensity, there was a collective sigh of relief, and at least for me, a sense of pride in being in such good company. You see, the outpouring of red ink was actually an expression of dad's care for our progress. He wanted to help each one of us sharpen our thinking and improve our articulation. Or maybe he just wanted us to write like Dick Merrill. Ask Patty about her experience taking administrative law with the uh, textbook he co-wrote. Dad's care and respect for others was perhaps most apparent in the way in which he really listened. Colleague, cousin, neighbor, friend, child, He genuinely listened and engaged. In the summer of 1980, our family was on one of those uh, odyssey vacations that Patty touched on. What that means, from my perspective, is that mom and dad had carefully identified the most significant national and state parks worthy of our attention, along with any historical or geological sites that they had ever read about, and had mapped out with precision the optimal route to string together visits to every site. Our family vacations were maneuvers worthy of the 1st Infantry Division. (laughs) Anyway, during this car ride on this particular trip, I asked Dad about his view on the boycott of the 1980 Olympics. He was supportive of Carter's decision. As As was my one, I took up the other side of the case, arguing that the athletes shouldn't be penalized for political squabbles. 
For at least an hour, he engaged with me, patiently hearing me out as I repeated my pitch. Bear in mind, I was 10 years old with little perspective and no facts whatsoever. (laughs) Yet he still listened. In conversations, as we've heard, he never judged and rarely prescribed. Rather, he helped people explore topics and find solutions on their own, not by giving advice from on high, but by, by being attentive and simply listening. He was always attentive. Ask our dear friend Bill Shanker about how Dad connected with his mother on her annual visits to Charlottesville. You see, Ma Shank dropped out of school in sixth grade to work in the family diner at the railroad yards. When she came to town, long retired from the diner, I might add, Dad would sit and talk with Ma Shank as though he were catching up with a fellow dean or another Rhodes Scholar. He met everyone on their home court on their terms because he truly respected and cared about what they had to say. It was natural, instinctive, not planned at all. Dad knew he could learn something from almost anyone he met, and he took the time to try. At each turn in my life, he was there listening, inquiring, and encouraging. I miss that. The respect he extended to others was rooted in humility. As so many of you have remarked, Dad was a truly humble man. Just consider how many of his various accomplishments or pursuits have come to light since his passing. Dad went about helping others and making a difference with relatively little fanfare and certainly no self-promotion. Anyone who encountered Dad also immediately felt his warmth. His easy smile, the sparkle from his squinting eyes, and the warm embrace were just accompaniments to a beautiful human spirit. Even when Parkinson's disease shrouded his persona, his warmth emanated. The caregivers at Westminster Canterbury who comforted Dad in recent years were all quick to say what a kind, good man he was to them. So as I wrap up, something that's hard to do since I have the chance to talk about Dad and the wonderful memories and lessons that he bestowed, I'll do something he was not inclined to do. Offer some unsolicited advice. Let's strive to embrace his qualities. Our world needs more people with his dedication, humility, and warmth. Listen to others as he listened to you. Attend to others as he attended to you. Seek new areas of inquiry and seek to make a difference. And of course, aim to be as considerate to anyone you encounter as he was. As we do this, rest assured that Dad's warmth and kind spirit will always be with us. How lucky we were to have Dick Merrill, my dad, in our lives. <laughs>